Well, nevertheless, we're here to talk about this great word of God. And I want to thank all who came to drive out here long distance. It's not because of me. It's because of this great word. And it should draw a crowd because we're getting to hear the word of God. And we're getting it here at the cost of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has delivered us these words. I always like to say this scripture in John chapter six, verse 60 of uh, verse 63. Jesus said the flesh, he says the spirit. That's what gives life. He says the flesh profits nothing. These words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. These words that we read in this book and in this Bible, they have a physical meaning. They have physical testimonies, but they also have a spiritual meaning. And when I can draw that spiritual meaning out of these pages, out of this book that are from God, that's when I write it on the tablet of my heart. That's when God becomes my God. That's when I don't forget his word. And so I always like to share that. Now, I do have the opportunity to give four sermons here. And the theme here is going to be one word, one word. And I'm sorry if I'm writing too small here. That word is come. That word is come. You see, we have these gospel meetings and obviously we come as the body of believers to come out and to hear a portion of God's word. But we also extend the invitation to the community. And hopefully we've done that. We've asked, hey, you know, come. And so these four sermons are going to are going to be based upon this one word. In Isaiah chapter 55, it starts out with this word. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come. And in the Old Testament, God has called for people, small and great, to come. Our second sermon here, we're going to do a part two of Isaiah chapter 55. We're going to talk about the, well, we're going to talk about the word come, but the sure mercies of David. There is a covenant by which God made with David. If I understand this covenant, the question I really ask is, what does that have to do with me today as a Christian? What does this covenant that was established by God, how does it affect my life? How does it apply to my life today as a Christian? And so we'll have a part one and a part two here this uh, this evening and also on Saturday and on Sunday morning. We're going to want to stick with the same theme in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor and heavy laden. That's what we're going to talk about. God has called for people to come and Jesus is doing the same thing. He's calling for people to come. And we're going to finish this series out in Mark chapter seven, verse 31. There is an Aramaic word and it's called epitha. And I'll give it to you. It means be open. You see, now I've come. And what is it that I need to be open to? What teachings? What are you going to give? What, what am I coming for? And so that's kind of our theme here. But here's our verse in Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. The Bible says here, and the spirit and the bride say, there it is, come. Let him who hears say, come. Let him who thirsts. Come, whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. You see, this is how the book ends with one word. And so I have a couple of questions here. We're going to be, these questions are derived from Isaiah chapter 55, the sure mercies of David. I didn't know this. And when I learned this, I was at a preacher's like I said, hey, brother, you know what? I'm going to work up a sermon on the sure mercies of David, because when I understand this, I can appreciate not only David, not only the covenant God has made, but also what a lot of people have. You know, I got six kids, believe it or not. And my wife, she's trained me well. She says, David, I know the baby of the family is Naomi, and she's the only girl. And she has wrapped around her finger. I said, no, she doesn't. Yes, she does. And she does. She does. And when I go into the store, she says, hey, you know, as soon as I get back in the car, she says, what did you get, Naomi? Oh, I didn't get her anything. But I had to tell Naomi a hundred times, no, because I already know when I get back in the car, mama's going to ask, if you get something for Naomi, you better get something for everybody else in the car. But she's my baby. But I'm your baby, too. We're your baby, too. You see, I'm acting like my kids here this evening. You've made a covenant with David. What do I get? Number one, how does one come to the waters? Number two, what can be bought without money? Number three, do the sure mercies of David apply today? Number four, when does God abundantly pardon? At what moment? And number five, how high is heaven? Now, we're not going to get through all these. All right, we most definitely will talk about the sure mercies of David because this is a part two of this covenant or this this testament well, which God has made with David. But before we go any further, we have our honor and privilege to go to our heavenly Father. Lord, please humble yourselves at this time.
So we, we're going to come to this great book of Isaiah. And when I'm always preaching out of the Old Testament, I love to give this chart here. There is a chart that I have found. I don't even know if it was a children's chart. And this chart here, in one snapshot, it gives me the setting of all the kings of Israel. In one setting. So we have this great nation of Israel. We know it started with King Saul. Then after Saul, we know that he was replaced by a great man named David. And now I always say that name is great, not because my name is great. Because my name. No, it's because God has declared him a man after his own heart. And then we also have Solomon. Well, in this chart, because I, the reason why I love it, because I love charts. Man, in this chart, it says, really? You had only three kings who reigned over all 12 tribes of Israel. And there you have it. Saul, David, and Solomon. Well, when we come to the book of Isaiah, where does he fall? And I always throw the prophets into this chart. It's really easy. Well, after Solomon, Solomon had a son by the name of Rehoboam. Rehoboam came in, and, and during the days of Solomon, there was a man by the name of Jeroboam. And God already told Solomon, because you love foreign women. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 1. The Bible says, but Solomon loved foreign women. After that chapter, it's crash and burn in the Bible. But, you know, I love reading my Bible until I get to 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 1. Well, because Solomon loved foreign women, God rose up this man by the name of Jeroboam, and he says, I will give you ten tribes, and I'm going to give Solomon two. Solomon tried to kill him. Jeroboam fled. Jeroboam now comes back during the days of his son, Rehoboam, and basically they're at odds, and the nation of Israel is divided. And now you have a southern king, and now you have a northern king because of this great divide. Well, in this southern kingdom, you only had 20 kings. In the northern kingdom, you had 20 kings. Now, if I asked you, well, which, 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 which territory was God with? He was with the southern kingdom, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. These other 10 tribes, now God wasn't with them. Now, so in the Bible, especially in Matthew chapter 1, when you're reading and it talks about the king or, or the, the genealogy of Jesus Christ, it's naming off the kings of Judah and that tribe and that lineage. Well, if I asked you, well, out of the 40 kings, 20 on this side and 20 on this side, 40 kings, how many kings were righteous in the northern kingdom absolutely none in the southern kingdom you had only eight kings and David well David's not popular and, they, and, and so but they're all eight are compared to David all kings are all the eight who were great they're compared to David well where does Isaiah fall in Isaiah falls in over here and now he's coming in in the, in the reign of four kings, that's where his testimony is from. And they are 13, 14, 15, and 16. And so this is where our, 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 our text takes place during the reigns of these kings. And now Isaiah here, man, if I was to ask how many times did Jesus quote or allude to the book of Isaiah, it was over 85 times. So the book of Isaiah has to be important. Well, if I say, okay, what are some important passages of scripture? Well, we have Isaiah chapter one. Do you know what it says in verse 18? Come, and that's our main theme. Come and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Um, at the end of that, it says, if you're willing and obedient, when you get to sit down and reason and talk to God, that's okay. God will come down to your level. He will reason with you, but there is no way you're gonna get up from the table and think that you won the debate. He says, if you are willing and obedient. And so God will reason with us. He's asked us to come. But you have to understand, uh, there's an obedience part that I have to partake of after I get up from this table. Well, we have Isaiah chapter 1. We have Isaiah chapter 6, where Isaiah sees God. He sees into the throne room of God. And he's even, and God says, who shall I send? He says, send me. And he sent him for one message. And that message was, you go tell these people, keep seeing and they shall not see. Keep hearing and they shall not perceive. And when I have a Bible study with people, I ask them, is the Bible sealed? Has God derived a book for men and women to read and has he purposely put a seal on it? You know what people tell me that had just recently got baptized? Almost 100 percent. 
They say, no, why would God do such a thing? And they're wrong. God has gotten to the point in Isaiah chapter 6, he doesn't give his knowledge away for free anymore. He's put a seal on it. If you turn over here to Isaiah chapter 28, real quick here. In Isaiah chapter 28, look at verse 9. Whom will he teach knowledge and whom will he make to understand the message? Those just winged from the milk? No. Those just drawn from the breast? No. Those are questions. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Well, that's how. So now I have to go precept upon precept, line upon. I have to, I have to, there's a chain. I have to kind of put it together, put the pieces together because God has gotten to the point during the, the reign or the prophecy of Isaiah. He's like, no, we're done. We're done. We're going to put a seal on it. Here it is. Turn to Isaiah chapter 29. Look at verse 9. Pause and wonder. Blind yourselves and be blind. Listen. They are drunk, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with intoxicating drink. For the Lord has poured out on you the spirit of deep sleep. You know, I sit down and have Bible studies with people, and I walk out saying, oh, man. He has the spirit of deep sleep. Listen now. He says here. For the Lord has poured out on you the spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, namely the prophets, and he has covered your heads, namely the seers. Here it is. The whole vision has become to you like the words of a book that is what? It's open. No, it ain't what your Bible says. It says the whole, ver the whole vision has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed. That's right. So during the days of Isaiah, now he says, you know what? Go and preach to these people and they're not going to understand. And the apostles go and ask Jesus, why do you speak to them in parables? Matthew chapter 13. He says, because to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but to them it has not been given. And the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. Seeing they shall see and not see. Hearing they shall hear and not perceive. To break the seal, we quite honest with you, you must be humble. According to the scriptures, it was the common people that heard Jesus gladly. I have to humble myself and go to this Lord and Savior and say, can you explain the parable to me? And that's why Jesus says in John 6, 63, the spirit is what gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words I speak are spirit and in life. Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of sayings in Isaiah. Good sayings in Jesus. Quote. We're only looking at one here. So when we turn to our main text here in Isaiah chapter 55, look at verse one here. It says, ho, everyone who thirsts comes to the waters. That's our first question here. How does one come to the waters? That's what we need to know. So now God is calling Ho. That word Ho just means a lot. I'll give you an example of what that means. I used to have my own fencing company. It was called D&D &D Fencing. It wasn't, it wasn't nothing spectacular. Hold on, calm down. All right. It was called D&D &D Fencing. I had fancy business cards. My slogan was building your fence one step at a time. That was my slogan. I said, man, that's a good one. Because it was literal. I was the only man in the company. And I was literally building your fence one step at a time. But she didn't need to know that. I'd get it done in a week. But if you ask, I tell you. The crew is coming. He's the salesman. He's the secretary. And he's also the fence builder. But I put D&D &D because I had just my firstborn. And it was David and Davey. When he got old enough, well, you know he was going to come to business. Well, you know his days were coming. Well, having this fence business I remember there was a day I got my air I got my my air compressor I got all my tools and my air compressor goes out now I have to finish this fence I can't leave the job and go no you know what I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna nail all the, it's just the pickets I'm gonna nail all the pickets by hand and I thought I was good I said like, I'm gonna do it like this and just bam I ain't got time to sit here and hammer three four times for one nail and I grabbed that nail yeah oh, I hit my thumb but you know what? I realized something about myself that day. I didn't say a cuss word. I said a loss. You see, in the Bible, when they said a loss, it was for the, it was for inflicting pain. They would rip their clothes. A loss. It was for hey, you know, I'm joy. <laughs> it's it's a it's a statement of joy and grief at the same time. And I said, you know what? I can't use cuss words, so I'm gonna use Bible words. A loss. Can't get in trouble for that. Well, God here is calling out to everyone. He's saying, oh, everyone, everyone who thirsts come to the waters. Now, we have to ask the question, what is the waters? 
There's a story in John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, this conversation takes place. We understand this story to mean, or the story to be called, the Samaritan woman at the well. The Samaritan woman at the well. In John chapter 4, verse 5, he came to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave his son Joseph. Now, Joseph, sorry, now Joseph's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. What is, what is the sixth hour? Well, the, in the days of a Jew, their hour started at six o'clock. So when I'm reading the Bible and it says the sixth hour, I just add six to it. That's 12 o'clock. It is dead new. It's the heat of the day. And Jesus is at this well. And this woman now is coming to draw. Jesus has sent his disciples off because he said, hey, go buy us some food. Jesus knows what he's doing. I need you to get away. Go get some Snickers. And so now they go on this journey. They go find some food. This woman is coming. And Jesus starts this conversation with one question. We're going to fast forward here. Look at verse nine. Well, verse seven, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink for his disciples had gone away into, into the city to buy food. Now, brother Aaron, I love brother Aaron. And I say, hey, brother Aaron, you know what? The one thing I've learned is that, man, if I can find simple sayings to spark a conversation, they can lead to spiritual things. And I say, hey, my brother, this is what I've learned. When I go to people and I say, hey, Hey, how's it going? My name's David, and we're talking about things. And now I want that conversation to turn spiritual. I say, have you found a good church home? Now, don't ask Aaron. Aaron's going to say, have you found a home church? I said, brother, you're tearing the saying up. You say, have you found a good church home? You want to know why that question has, it, it's so, it, it has so much more meaning. Why? Because people say, man, I have a church home, but it ain't good. See, I asked, do you have a church? I asked, do you have a good church? Have you found a good church? And some people say, you know what? I've been looking for a church. You see, it doesn't allow them to say yes or no. I need you to start talking. Jesus here, this woman comes in. Jesus says, hey, can I have a drink of water? Do you know from that one question, the whole city of Samaria was saved. You see, how do I get people to come? How do I get them to come? Man, it ain't about knowing a hundred scriptures. That's great. But it's not going to start with that. I got to be able to understand how to break the ice. Well, Jesus knows how to break the ice. So in John chapter 4 here, verse 7, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink for me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Verse 10. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and he who, is, who, who I'm sorry, and, and who, it, who it was who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Hold on now. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you go get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who, is, who gave us the well and drank from him himself as well as his sons and his livestock? The question I ask is, what is the water? Jesus said, if you ask me to drink, I would give you living waters. Well, now God here is saying, oh, come to the waters. And now Jesus is saying, hey, give me a drink. I would give you a living water. What is Jesus offering this woman? You see, we don't know from this passage of scripture. We don't know. There's a more specific passage here in John chapter 7 here. In John chapter 7, look here at verse 37. On that last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Same conversation. This is the last great day of the feast. Now, Jesus, if any man thirsts, let you come. And I'll, I'll give you a drink. He says, if any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. What is it? What is, what is it? You're just saying the same thing over and over. Listen now. Look at verse 30, 39. But this he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. That's right. You see, in Isaiah chapter 55, ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to work. God is offering everyone the Holy Spirit. 
Jesus was offering this Samaritan woman at the well the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give you one more. We have to move on. This is only verse 1. There's a conversation. We know it. This is in Matthew chapter 19. You have the rich young ruler, right? And as this rich young ruler, as Jesus is having this correspondence with this rich young ruler, the apostles are witnessing this conversation. As they're sitting back looking, this man had rejected Jesus because he couldn't do one thing. In the Old Testament, in Exodus chapter 20, you have the Ten Commandments. Well, they actually have 613 commandments. Those 613 can be broken down to 10. Those, six, those 10 can be broken down to 2. And there was one who came to Jesus and said, which one is the greatest command? Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. You know, those are the first four commandments. They deal with God. That's all. They, they deal directly with your God. The next six commandments, they deal with your neighbor. And so when Jesus is having this conversation with this rich young ruler in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus literally only quotes five out of the six. And the young ruler says, I've done all these. Yes, you have. You don't. He says, you lack one. It was the last one. The last and tenth commandment in Exodus chapter 20 is, thou shall not covet. It was covetousness. Well, that's not our point here. If you turn over here to Matthew chapter 19, look how this conversation ends here. In Matthew chapter 19, look at verse 25. When his disciples heard it, right, this rich young ruler, he says, now nah, I can't give up my, 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 my riches and my possessions. He walked away. Look at verse 25. When his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? That's the question. If this young ruler who only lacked one commandment can be, who can be saved? We know, we know. For Jesus says, with men, it is impossible. With God, all things are possible. Let's read that, right? And so we have verse 25 here. When the disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said to them, with men, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. Look at verse 27. Then Peter answered and said to him, see, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? You see, I'm not being selfish to see. You see, you've given the sure mercies to David. What am I going to have? And we're going to get to that. Well, the apostles have seen that this man couldn't leave all. We have left all. What are we going to get? And he's talking to the 12 apostles here. Listen now. Verse 28. So Jesus said to them, the apostles, Assuredly I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That's what the apostles get. That's the first resurrection in the book of Revelations, and we'll talk about that later sometime. And so Jesus here is saying, the 12 apostles, you're going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, here's my question. Well, then let me be selfish. What am I going to get? Look at verse 29. And everyone, this is me and you, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. What, what am I getting? He says, but many of you shall receive a hundredfold. Uh, that's the Holy Spirit. And he says, oh, yeah, eternal life. You see, when I forsake all these things, I get to have a drink of water. That living water is the Holy Spirit. Well, we, 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 hopefully I've, I've shown you here this understanding here of our main text here in Isaiah chapter 55. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. That's the Holy Spirit. Moving on to verse 2 here. Look at verse 2. It says here, why do you, I'm sorry, well verse 1. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me here and your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The sure mercies of David. Here's our lesson. We'll get to slow down a little bit here. In verses two and three, he says, you know what? I'm offering you this, this spirit of mine. This Holy Spirit of mine. But you know what? Uh, are you willing to drink milk and honey? 
Remember, we're talking about spiritual understanding here. Listen, one more time. And you, it says, come to the waters and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. On my Bible cover here, I've had this Bible for 20 years. And my wife, she says, you know what, honey? I would love to buy you a new Bible. It's a waste of time. You ain't going to read it. You're going to keep reading no rust in here. I said, that's right. I'm going to keep it. And so she said, well, you know what? Well, perhaps we can get you a Bible cover. And there was a brother in the church. He had just got a Bible. He got a brand. Oh, it was nice. I said, man, where'd you get that from? No, it's not a new Bible. I just got a Bible cover. There's a guy who has his own business and he's, he's investing in just covering Bibles and making wallets. I said, oh, I need to see him. And I gave him my Bible. He says, yes, I can help you, but there is a problem here. I said, what's the problem? I'm going to have to take your Bible. What? Yeah, I know that's a problem for a lot of y'all Bible readers, but I can't make you a Bible cover without basically having your Bible. I said, that makes sense. That makes sense. How long can I have my Bible? It, it, I'm going to get it to you as soon as I can. I already know it's hard. And he says, well, I have one more thing. Before I take your Bible, you know, I also I, I do impressions and I can write anything you want on your Bible. Would you like me to say the word of God, the sword? I mean, I know y'all like to get fan. I said, no, just put milk and honey. No, on the front cover, I said, put milk and honey. Okay, man, do you want your name on the Bible, man? Yeah, put, put David Jordan on the Bible. And he gives me the Bible cup. I'm like, oh, man, this is nice. I love it. He says, I'm not going to lie to you, man. I didn't want to put milk and honey, but this is your Bible. Why did you put milk and honey? I've never heard of that. And on the front cover? If I was to ask the question, what did milk and honey represent to a Jew? When they heard the phrase milk and honey, what, came, what immediately came to their mind? Well, in the burning bush passage, in Exodus chapter 3, we, it begins with Moses. Moses, got, the Lord had declared something to Moses, and, he, and Moses was, declare, was to declare this to the nation of Israel. Listen here, in, in Exodus chapter 3, look at verse 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people. Exodus chapter 3, verse 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their task, their, uh, their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the land of the, of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Pezzarites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Yeah. When a Jew heard, oh man, that's the good and large land flowing with milk and honey. God called it the glory of all lands. That's what God called it. So when a Jew heard, no, nah, I know exactly. Let's go here to Deuteronomy chapter 8. In, De in Deuteronomy chapter 8, it really nails it home. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, we're going to start here from verse 6 here. He says, therefore, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord, your God, to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord, your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs that flow out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper when you have eaten and are full. Then you shall bless the Lord, your God. For the good land which he has given you. Woo! Yes, that's right. The juice is, man, this is good. I'm going to get to eat to my field. You know, I didn't get to do that here this evening. No, I'm at Brother Danny's house. I said, man, I just don't eat before I preach. I can't get full. I'm sorry. I, I'll be falling half asleep over here. Before a Jew, when they heard the, they heard the land flowing with milk and honey, it was a physical understanding. My question is, when a Christian hears milk and honey, what shall come to my mind? It's not the land flowing. It's the word of God. Do you know the word of God is milk and honey? And the nation of Israel did not understand. Yes, God is giving you a physical land that has this milk flowing with the copper and all this barley and food. But he's also giving you something else. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 4 here. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, look at verse 7. For what great nation is there that has 
that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us for whatever reason we may call upon him and what great nation is there that has such great statues and righteous judgments that are in his that are in this law which I set before you this day only take heed to yourself and dil and diligently keep yourself lest you forget the things your eyes have seen and lest you depart and lest your heart departs from uh, lest your heart and all the days depart from all the days of your life and teach them to your children and to your grandchildren, especially concerning the day you stood before the Lord, your God in horror. When the Lord said to me, gather the people to me and I will let them hear my words that they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth and that they may teach their children. They didn't understand. The spiritual meaning of this milk and honey. So now it says, oh, everyone come thirst. I will offer you my spirit. But you know what? It's actually milk and honey. It's his word. Now I got to prove it now. You got you to prove in the scriptures that the Bible says it is milk and honey. Mm. I want you to turn over here to Ezekiel chapter three. In Ezekiel chapter three, Ezekiel is handed something in his hand. Look at verse one. Moreover, he said to me, son of man, eat. What you find, eat this scroll and go. Speak to the house of Israel. And so I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat that scroll. And he said to me, son of man, feed your belly and fill your stomach with this scroll that I may, he says, that I give you. So I ate and it was in my mouth like honey and sweetness. He's given this scroll, this word of God. And he says, you need to eat the scroll. You need to learn these words, write them on your hearts. But he said, it tasted like honey and sweetness. Do you know if I was to ask a Jew, what did manna taste like? That's Exodus 16. You know, that word manna means, what is it? They didn't know what it was. That's what manna means. What is this? Coriander seed, what is this? But when they tasted it, what did it taste like? Honey. That's Matthew 4. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every what word that proceeds out the mouth of God. You see, this word honey represents God's word being everlasting. There was an archaeologist and he did an excavation and he digged up from one of the tombs of Egypt. And guess what he found? He found a jar. Silver and gold. What we hit? We got. No, sorry, it wasn't silver and gold this time. And he opens it up. Guess what was in the jar? It was honey, but it was crystallized. And all they did was go and they warmed it and it came, it was restored. This is hundreds of years old. You know, honey is called a superfood. People call it God's food. It doesn't expire. The word of God will never expire. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but these words that I speak to you, and so the Bible here is calling itself honey. I got it. Well, how is it milk? You know, I used to be a milkman. That's right. And I told him, he said, you used to be a milkman? I used to be a milkman. You know, in the milk business, you know what we call milk? We call it white gold. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know that. That's white gold. And, you know, when I was back home and now that I've been preaching, I've got out in the milk business and I went to I went to Walmart and I went to see a price of the milk. It was eight dollars. Oh, man, it is like go. Hey, man, hey, I need to eat one bowl of cereal every other day. We ain't doing this breakfast, lunch and dinner. So it is white gold. But you never know how much a gallon of milk is until you spill it on the ground and then you have to go and wash your truck out. You're like, man, a gallon of milk is a lot. That's a lot of work. Well, what does the word, what does the word of God have to say about milk? In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, we know the verse. It says here, therefore, laying aside all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. That's right. Milk is a nourishment. Physically, everyone who's born, you're drinking milk. You're drinking milk. That's the only that's the only source of survival. And when you're baptized, the milk of the word is your only source of survival. There's no growth without it. And so I need to learn the elementary principles of Christ. That's Hebrews chapter six, verse one. We spoke about that today, brother Aaron. And I need to learn all these six prince, elementary principles 
to the T. And that's why we have Bible study after you're baptized. You're going to know all of them to the T. And so therefore now you can grow thereby. And now you, you know what? Don't forget them because they're honey. And I'm about to get off of this stint here. Here's my last one. In Isaiah chapter 7, here's the greatest one you ask me. King Ahaz was asked by God. He says, ask for a sign. Either in the heights of heaven or in the depths below. You know, Ahaz told God, I ain't doing it. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. God tests us today. He tests us. And so now he says here in, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 10, moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz. He said, ask for a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz says, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. He did right. He did right. You know, when my mother comes and says, hey, you know, you don't need to be baptized in order to be saved. Mm -hmm. No, I don't believe that. Hey, you know, when my dad comes and says, hey, you know what? You don't have to go to church every Sunday. I don't believe that. You see, those are one of the hardest tests that I'll have. It's my loved ones who don't understand. But yet I have to be true to my God and myself. Nevertheless, here, we're looking for milk and honey. Look at verse 12. But Ahaz said, I will not test. He says, he says, I'm sorry, I will not ask nor test the Lord. Verse 13. Then he said, here now, O house of David, it is a small thing for you to worry men, but will you worry my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. That's Jesus, God with us. Listen, he says, curds and honey he shall eat. Oh, that's, that word curds means milk. That's butter. He says, milk and honey he shall eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land by which you dread will be forsaken. You see, Jesus, he feasted upon milk and honey. That was the word of God. And that caused him to understand, hey, I'm going to choose the good over the evil because of God's word. So now we hopefully understand, hey, this milk and honey. Well, now we come to the second part here of this verse from two and three. He says, now you need to, what, what can be bought without money? So if God is offering me this spirit of his, right, this hundredfold, if God is saying, hey, you know what? It's like milk and honey. Man, it's good. I got you. Then he says, hey, you know what? You can't buy it without money. You can't purchase it with money. Well, how do you buy it? Hold on now. You told me to come and yet you're asking me to have the particular of the spirit, but I can't purchase it with money. Look at Proverbs chapter 17, verse 16. It says here, why is there in the hand of the fool the purchase price of wisdom when he has no heart for it? One more time. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 16. Why is there in the hand the purchase price of wisdom, but he ain't got no heart for it? One more. Look at Proverbs chapter 23, verse 23, and we'll go there. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 23. It says, buy the truth and do not sell it. Also, wisdom and instruction and understanding. You have to buy it, but you can't use money. We ain't got there yet. Look at Revelations here, chapter 3, verse 18. We know this one. This is Jesus here. He's speaking to the church in Laodicea. Listen to what he says here. In Revelations chapter 3, verse 18. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira, right? I'm sorry, Thyatira. These things says the God... I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong one. It is Laodicea. Sorry about that. In Revelation chapter 3, look at verse 18. He says here, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Jesus is speaking to this church in Laodicea and he's telling them, I counsel you to buy from me. Well, how do you buy it? Turn to Matthew chapter 16 and we come to our answer. In Matthew chapter 16, this is always a chapter here that puzzles my mind. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus asked the apostles a simple question. Who do you say that I, who do men say that I am, the son of man? And they said, some of them say you're, you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Jeremiah. Uh, some say you're one of the prophets or Elijah. And then he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter rose up and says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. In the next scene, Jesus tells them the Son of Man must be suffer and be, and be brought into the hands of sinners and die. And Peter goes and grabs Jesus. I will never let you. No, I'm not letting it happen to you. 
And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, for you're an offense to me. You're not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. Hold up. You just anointed this man. And in the next sitting, you said, get behind me, Satan. Man, that's a rough day. Nevertheless, here, look at Matthew chapter 16 here. The question that we're asking here is, how do you buy something that God is offering without money? Look at verse 24. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each one according to his works surely i say to you there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of god coming in his power jesus here is saying that when you come and you ask for this holy spirit and hey it's milk and honey it's going to cost you your life it's going to cost you everything that you have you know there's a brother who just got baptized and matter of fact he got baptized right before we got on the plane that night and he came to church he came a brother in the church simply said, hey, you know, would you like to go to church? Have you found a good church home? It worked. Got him. No, I haven't. And so he, now he comes to church and he's there on Sunday. We had a brother's meeting. I couldn't get my hands on him because I had to go to the brother's meeting. And so I said, I hope they'll be here next Sunday. Now he came on Wednesday. And now he comes on. He's the first person in the, in the parking lot. And so I said, oh, that's, that's, that's one of the brethren. And then I, I said, oh, no, that's Thomas. Oh, he's coming. He's thirsty. You see, when he got out the car, he said, man, I live all the way across town. I didn't actually go home yet. So I've been here for about an hour. Because if I went home, there's no way I can make it back to church. You see, he's willing to give his life. He said, man, I, I was here Sunday and I heard your message. And I'm hoping you're, well, I'm actually preaching this Wednesday when we have a rotation but this is the truth. And so now he's sitting there and now he's like, hold on. Uh, I have to ask you a question. Yes, what's your question? I answer his questions. I said, I have a question for you. Well, if I just ask you, what must I do to be saved? What would you tell me? And he gave me his testimony. And it was wrong. And I gave him the testimony of Jesus Christ. He said, I, uh, now it's an hour of going back and forth. My wife is sitting in the back. I'm looking at her and she's like, okay, we're going to do it. No, we're not going to do it. Go put the stuff up. Hey, we're going to do it. Go get it. No, we're not going to do it. Hey, go turn the water on. No, no, we're not going to have to do it. What's going to happen? And there was a sister in the church. She said, hallelujah. He says, I'm going to do it. But before he said, I will do it, he had one question. He said, Dave, this is my last and final question. I said, I don't believe that. Go ahead. Are you telling me I need to take everything that I believe and know and throw it in the trash. My whole life. I said, my friend, there are some things you know. You, you're quoting scripture, but you're not able to put the pieces together. You're like Apollos. We're going to have to come and clean some stuff up in the backside and get this thing right so you can be speaking and know the truth. You're going to have to lose your life. You see, this is the only way that I can come and the only way that I can purchase this spirit of God is by laying down my cross and bearing his cross, denying myself and taking up his cross and following after him. Well, we're going to move on here. It says here, if you're willing to do this, listen now, this is the sequence of events. If I hear the call, if I'm willing to say I'm thirsty, humble myself. If I'm willing to say, hey, you know what? I'll buy some of that and I'll even use my life. I can't use money. God says, you know what? Now, since we came and reasoned together, since you come, I will give you what? The sure mercies of David. What is the sure mercies of David real quick here? Look at verse three here. Incline your ear and come to me here and your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The sure mercies of David. What are they? Listen what he says here. Indeed, I have given him as a witness to the people, a leader and a commander for the people. 
And we're gonna we're, we're gonna we're gonna end with this last verse here. I appreciate your attention. God here now says, I will give you the sure mercy of David if you're willing to do the sequence of events. Well, what is the sure mercy of David? I want you to turn over here to 2 Samuel chapter 7. Second Samuel chapter 7. Look at verse 1. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1. Now it came to pass when the king was dwelling in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies all around that the king said to Nathan, the prophet, see now I dwell in the house of Seir, but the ark of God dwells in tent curtains. David has now, he's become king. He's, he's king over all of Israel, all 12 tribes. He has now built him a house of Seir. He looks out the window. He says, man, the house of God dwells in tent curtains and I live in a house of Seir. David did something on this day that caused God to say, no, I need to make a covenant with David. And I'm going to call it the sure mercies of David. And so David now, he's in his house, and now he's looking at the house of God. They ain't adding up. Do we do that? Do we come to God's house and we say, man, the house of God needs to be full. It's not enough to sit here and just preach to one another. I got to share what I got with my friends and my family, my sphere of influence. I got I to get people in God's house. Hey, you know what? You come and the grass ain't cut. You say, no, that ain't good enough. But if you go to my house, man, I got that. I'm edging the grass. I'm throwing seed. And I come to God's house. And <sighs> you see, everybody has a part in God's house. Whether I'm cutting the grass or I'm up here in the pool pit. Or I'm, I'm the woman who, who makes all the food. They're not giving you a hamburger helper. They're making it from scratch. They're taking care of God's house. We all have a part. And so David here sees this house of God and he said, oh man, no, this ain't good enough here. This is unacceptable here. Listen now, look at verse three. Then Nathan said to the king, I'm sorry, verse two. That the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now I dwell in the house of Seir, but the ark of God dwells inside tent curtains. Then Nathan said to the king, Go do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But he happened, it says, but it happened that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build a house for me to dwell in? For I have not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought the children of Israel up from Egypt, even to this day, but have moved about in tent, I'm sorry, in a tent and in a tabernacle. It says, wherever I have moved about with all the children of Israel, have I ever spoken a word to anyone from the tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people of Israel, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord, the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people of Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And you have, he says, and have made you a great name, like the name of the great men who were all, who were on the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them and that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them anymore as previously since that time I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused you to rest from all your enemies also the Lord tells you that he will what make you a house hold up because David was concerned about his new house of cedar no no because David was concerned about God's house. God said, no, you good. I don't have a house. You can't make me a house to dwell in. But man, guess what? Because you were concerned about my house. He says, I'm going to give you a house. What? Hold on now. Listen now. Look at verse 12. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up for your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. Listen now, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. He will, he says, he, he says, I will be his father and he shall be my son. Do you know that there's Old Testament to teach God to be your father? No. The Old Testament taught you to be, I'm the great I am. You know, before the law, no one knew God as Lord Jehovah. Not before Exodus, not before Moses. They only knew him as God Almighty, El Shaddai. That's all they knew him as. And then God comes to Exodus and says, hey, you know what? Now everyone in the world is going to know me as 
the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, the existing one. And now Jesus comes and says, now I'm going to change the game. You are now going to know God as your father, your Abba father. But in the Old Testament, I'm looking at a covenant and God is saying, I'm going to let you call me father. Listen now, he says, but my, he says, verse 15, but my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed before you and your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be an everlasting forever. And so now God has told David, because you were concerned about my house, I will give you a house. Now, I can't go through all of this in Psalms chapter eight. I'm Psalms chapter 89. You find the details to the contract. There are specific details to this contract which God made with David. Now, remember, I asked the question, how does this apply to me as a Christian today? Where's my, where's my? Here it is. Well, in Psalms 89, look at verse 19. Here's parts of the contract here. He says, then you spoke in a vision to your holy one and said, I have given help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found my servant David with whom my holy oil I have anointed him. With whom my hand shall be established, also my arm shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. I will beat down his foes before his face and plague those who hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall, shall be with him, and in my name his horn shall be exalted. Also I will set up his hand over the sea and his right hand over the rivers. He shall cry to me, you are my father and my God and the rock of my salvation. Also I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My mercy I will, keep, I will keep for him forever, and my covenant shall stand with him firm. His seed also I will make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. You know, I always ask myself a question. Man, is God showing partiality? Hold on. I can read about David and Bathsheba. David taking Uriah, killing the man, taking his wife, her bearing a child. This is sin upon sin upon sin. Oh, you forgot something, David. David's house was the only house in the Old Testament that was covered with mercy. You see, God made a covenant with David. And he says, I'll never cut off your descent. There will always be someone to sit on your throne. Look at verse 30. If his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgment, if they break my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will not, I will not utterly take from him, nor allow my faithfulness to fail. My covenant I will not break. You see, David had a covering. He had a covering of mercy. His whole house. What does this have to do with me today? There's another example in Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 17. And it goes, God goes so far to say, if you can break my covenant with the day and you can break my covenant with the night, then I will break my covenant with David. That we still have days and nights, seasons, four seasons. It's still in existence here today. Look at Acts chapter 13. When Jesus rose from the dead in Acts chapter 13, Jesus received two things when he rose from the dead. Two things. In Acts chapter 13, take a look here. Jesus here received two things. We're going to start here in Acts chapter 13. We're going to start here from verse 32. And we declare to you glad tidings that promise which was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, and that he has raised up Jesus as it is also written in the second Psalm. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. That, what that means is when Jesus rose from the dead, God had two things. Where are they at? The first thing he says, oh, today you are my son. Today I have forgotten you. That's Hebrews chapter 5, verse 5. Jesus became high priest. As soon as he rose from the dead, God said, here you go. There's your, you're the high priest today. Hebrews 5, verse 5. Same scripture. You are my son. Today I have forgotten you. Jesus got something else when he rose from the dead. Let's keep reading here. Verse 33, God has fulfilled this for us, their children, and that he has raised up Jesus. And it's also written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Verse 34, and that he has raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He has spoken to us, I will give you the sure mercies of David. When Jesus rose from the dead, he was given the sure mercies of David. What is that? Hold on now. In Zechariah chapter 12, verse 7. 
There is a prophecy of scripture here. Listen now. The question is, what does this have to do with you and I today as Christians? In Zechariah chapter 12, verse 7. Listen to what it says. The Lord will save the tents of Judah first so that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall not come, shall not become greater than that of Judah. In that day, the Lord will, def will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who was feeble among you in that day, he shall be like David. Listen now. And the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. It shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. This covenant by which now God has given to David first, he gave it to Jesus. He says, I'll give it to you. But guess who you have to look like? You have to look like David. You know, in, in Matthew chapter one, verse one, it says the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham. No, it doesn't say that. It says the son of David. Then it says the son of Abraham. You see, this covenant by which God has given David. He also wants to offer to you. You know what this means for us? You know what? If you sin against your God, the only reason you have forgiveness is because when I got baptized, God gave me the sure mercies of David. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, it says, he says, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if you sin. You have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. You see, you have been given the sure mercies of David as a Christian. I have entered into covenant with my God. But now here's my question. And now I'm being like my daughter Naomi and my kids. Where's my house? You gave David a house. You gave Jesus a house. Let's just be real. I'm like, Peter, what shall I have? Where's my house, God? You know, in John 14, these are the words of our Lord. In John chapter 14, verse 1, and we're coming to a close. It says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, also believe in me. In my father's house, there are many mansions. If there were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. There, it says that where I am, there you may be also. And it says, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. You see, because I'm concerned about the things of the house of God, because I have been given the sure mercies of David, because I have entered into contract with my God, because I look like David, I'm willing to give everything for it. God says, I'll give you a house. That's not a literal mansion. That's heavenly real estate. The nation of Israel, when they actually entered into the land flowing with milk and honey, what were they given? They were given territory. They were, that, that territory was divided in 12 tribes and they got all their territory. And God says, I've given you all the milk and honey physically. But today I'm searching for my spiritual house, heavenly country. You see the sure mercies of David, how does it apply today? It's because as a Christian, I get to enjoy the mercy of my God, but I can't abuse it. I can't, allow, I can't allow my liberty to become a stumbling block or a cloak or device. Can't do that. And so this is something that I've come to understand about this word or this covenant by which God has made with David. How God has also delivered this to Jesus. And how Jesus says, if you're willing to take care of my house, then I will give you a house. The house of God is very important to God. God is very sensitive about his house and I'm done. You know, I have a wife. And my wife is a very good interior decorator. Man, she's good. But there are times where I say, hey, honey, uh, I don't think that's going to look good. Dang, that, the color scheme is off a little bit. And if I change anything and I'm thinking I'm doing it to make it better, and she leaves and I change and she comes back and she says, oh, hold on, did you move? I'm like, dang, how did you see that? How did you know that? Because she's sensitive about her house. Everything has a place. And now I learned I'm just going to leave it alone. And it ends up being green. Because she's going to have a better decorative eye than I. And I've come to learn that. But in God's house, we have to allow ourselves.
to put the kingdom of God first and all his righteousness. And all these things will be added to us. Are we willing to do that here this evening? Are we willing to enter into covenant with our God? Are we willing to come? Are we willing to give all that we have? Are we willing to put the house of God first? And then God says, I'll promise you some a heavenly territory. If that's the case, please come. And that's the theme here of our, of our gospel meeting here. I don't know the hearts and minds of everyone who is here. I thank you for coming out. Uh, hopefully, there is a lot more. There are actually 13 verses here in, in Isaiah chapter 55. We only got to 34. God wants us to understand about this covenant. And so that's kind of why I made it a two-part series about this great man by the name of David. And so we need to look like David. We need to have the heart of David. And we need to walk like our Christ. Those are my thoughts. If you're here and you desire milk and honey, the word teaches that you must hear the word, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. This is the elementary principles of Christ. This is how I'm born again, according to John chapter 3. If you're here, maybe you've been born again. Maybe you just need the prayers of the church. Or maybe you just need the prayers for strength. Please come as we stand and sing this song. It's a lot. Thanks for watching this video. I know what you're thinking. I don't want to miss another video from this channel. In order to avoid that, click on the red button down there, subscribe, and then click the bell icon. Not only will that alert you each time a new video is uploaded to the channel, it will also help spread the channel to other people's awareness. So, go ahead. Do it. Like right now. Click on it.